Open up to John 14. We'll be reading John 14, verses 15 through 17 this morning. As we get back into the Gospel of John after taking some time out on, in Exodus 20. But let us hear the Lord's word for us this morning. Verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot, cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You may be seated. Now, before we took some time in Exodus 20 on looking at the Ten Commandments, before that, we spent some time hashing out how we keep the commandments of Christ. What does that look like? How, does that, how can we even do that in the first place? This, if you remember, came from the guarantee that if, if there is love, the love of Christ in us, then we will keep his commandments. It's a guarantee. It will happen. It will happen and it will grow. So if that love exists then we will see fruit in obedience. That love of Christ is something that's possessed by Christ and comes from Christ. It's not something that we do. We cannot love God in any way, shape, or form within ourselves, no matter what, before we are born again, before we are alive. And that comes by the grace of God through the preaching of the gospel, not by any other means, but by that. So this love comes within us. He pours it into our hearts. And by that love working within us, we love God and we love neighbor. So that comes out in many, many different ways. And this keeping the commandments is not something that's in doubt. Again, it will happen. It will happen. But how will it happen again? We explained it back then. As we were studying this, but we'll explain it more in detail now as we get into and continue on uh, verses 15 through 17 today. So the spirit of truth, the other helper who is with the, who is, uh, who is the father, who will be, who the father gives, and he will give the, this other helper, this another helper to his disciples, to Christ's disciples. This also happens for everyone who comes to be saved. This is not just for a specific 12. As we know, for all of Scripture, this comes, the Father gives the Spirit to those that He saves in time, in space, in human history. He comes and gives them as they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as they trust in Him, solely looking to Him and Him alone, away from themselves, throwing all of their self-righteousness, whatever that may be, and looking to Him and Him alone. They believe upon Him, and that is a very work of the Spirit. That is very the first fruits of the Spirit as He is in us. So a question that could come up here, and given the sequence of this text itself, is the Spirit given to us after we obey Jesus' commandments? Right? We could... Come to that conclusion, possibly, by reading the text. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. So after you keep my commandments, then I'll give you this other helper. But is that what he's saying? By our obedience, then we're given the Spirit. Not at all. This is in a specific context. Jesus is talking to specific disciples in a time in, in a specific time in human history exclusively to them, and that needs to be an understanding of ours, recognizing that, because if we say that our, by our obedience, then the Spirit is given to us, that's completely contrary to the rest of God's Word. So the teaching of Scripture is abundantly clear. We do not get the Spirit after we obey. So the timing of the giving of the Spirit here is critically important. It's before the cross. So he's saying that after the cross, the Spirit will come. 
And so that's looking ahead to Pentecost. That will soon happen. So that needs to be the context in which we understand how Jesus is speaking to these specific disciples and understand that sequence of events. That's only for that time period. Now, this will have a lot of implications on their life then as they come into Pentecost, as they come in and out of Pentecost, they will face much, much, much difficulty in life. So much hardship, so much opposition over and over and over again. And so the Spirit will come in that time after Christ, after all of His finished work. He will pour the Spirit into their heart and they will come. And Peter shows it right away. Right out of the gate, he's preaching Christ and Him crucified. He's preaching the gospel on that day of Pentecost. So we see a great change in people like Peter as they face the ways of the world, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This will be critical to have the Spirit driving them to obey the will of God for them as He calls them to go out. They cannot do this on their own. They have no strength in and of themselves in any way, shape, or form to do this. And so Jesus is driving them to the fact that they will have another helper. So in this, we'll look at number one, another advocate. That's the title of the sermon. So if you're following along in your bulletin, you're encouraged to take notes. Number one, another advocate. Number two, why can't the world receive him, the other advocate? And number three, what are the implications for us? And so we start off with another advocate. What's to begin noticing here? Out of those two words, what should we notice? Another. It's kind of interesting. It should make us kind of stop, like another advocate. 1 John 2.1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus was and is our advocate if we are alive in him. But if we do not truly trust in him alone and show evidence of that reality that's been made new and alive within us by following him in obedience and growing in that manner, then he is not our advocate. We're showing evidence of that. We have no advocate in that situation. So if you are in that situation, you have no advocate at this present time. Unless you trust in him who is the righteous one. And that goes into the meaning of advocate. And we'll get into that in a minute. An advocate first, we'll get into it right now, right? Advocate first is someone who gives evidence that stands up in court for someone else on their behalf. Jesus is our first advocate who went before the Father on our behalf, didn't he? Offered himself up, act of obedience, living a perfect life, sinless life, obedience to the law, fulfilling the law, offering himself up as the sacrifice presented to God, So Jesus is our first advocate. He is the only one, the only one who can obliterate our record of debt for us before the judge. We all stand before the judge. We have a record that is condemned, that is guilty, marred in completeness. So we need someone to stand in our place and to take away that debt, to obliterate it. And Jesus does that. As an advocate, he steps in, presents a case, his case, that then the judge says, not guilty. You are right because of your advocate. He is the only reason why we can be declared by God, declared justified. By his act of obedience, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By his passive obedience, there is now no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
the love and justice of God collided at the cross in Christ. Because Jesus was the only one who could take God's justice, take it upon himself, and then give God's love at the same time. The only one. And it's solely in what he does. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. No one. If we do not have this God-man stand in our place for us, then guess what? We have absolutely nothing at all. Nothing. All the things that we think we have, nothing. They're vanity. They're a mist. They're a mirage. And they're not even there. We have absolutely nothing without Christ. At that moment, the one thing that we do have is an eternity of wrath waiting for us. That is a reality that we cannot ignore, that we cannot turn away from. But those who stand in Christ, in that God-man, in that advocate, they are justified, forgiven, reconciled in him because of him. So that eternity of wrath that was waiting is gone. It's absolutely gone. And that record of debt, I love that word, obliterated. Because that's literally what happens. Canceling the record of debt, it's obliterated. Jesus is our first paracleton which is an advocate, a paraclete. It's the Greek term. More specifically, this first advocate of us sinners who trust in him, he is this advocate in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. It's the gospel. If you say the word advocate, you explain what that means with a sinner, a judge, the righteous one, the advocate, you're explaining the gospel. You get into those details of who that advocate is and what he's done for us. This is required for our salvation. He is required for our salvation. Then in part to solidify this salvation, he is our advocate who still goes to the Father. Right? When we're in him, when we're living in him in that new life, he still goes to the Father. Actively in human history. For us, during real time, from his position in heaven at the right hand of the Father, he is still interceding and advocating for his people. Why? Because John says we'll still sin. That doesn't mean that we need to be saved again. But it's an ongoing reality in the present reality of life that we still fall. And so he is constantly saying, Lord, Father, look at my record. That was for them. It's amazing. This is what 1 John 2, 1 is drawing out, this first advocate. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have his present tense for those who are in Christ. Present tense for those who are born of God. It is a present reality for the believer that Jesus is advocating for his own people with the Father. So this is our first advocate, Jesus. And though Jesus is presently our advocate in heaven, we also have another advocate, right? John 14 is not talking about Jesus. Another advocate. Jesus himself is saying this. You're going to have another advocate. Who is this second advocate? It's the Holy Spirit. He is the advocate that Jesus is talking and speaking about. In this text, this advocate is the one who takes everything of Christ, everything of what he did for us, and literally gives it to us. Every characteristic of the definition of advocate for Jesus in John 2, 1 is to be understood in John 14, 16 because the word helper is advocate. So the Spirit takes what Jesus did, all of what he did, and gives it to us. 
Literally, in that time of life, when you come to life, wherever that may be, whenever that may be, he gives it to you. You actually possess righteousness because of Christ. Justification because of Christ. Alive, eternal life because of Christ. So he is our helper, our advocate It is to be understood in light of the specific purpose and role of the Holy Spirit in the plan of redemption. The Father decreed before the foundation of the world those who He would be gracious to. He didn't have to do that. But He decided He chose a certain people for Himself, specific people, because He's gracious, all of grace. He separated them, put them in Christ before the foundation of the world. And Jesus came to live, die, and rise and ascend for them. Perfect unity. Perfect unity in that work and in that plan. And then the Spirit comes to give that, the gift of eternal life, the justification in Christ, the forgiveness in Christ. Give that to you while you're still dead in trespasses and sin. It's the grace of God. So the Holy Spirit is not the one who was born of a virgin. He's not the one who lived a perfect, obedient life, (coughs) obeying the law. He was not the one who was betrayed. He was not the one who was falsely accused and hung on a cross. He was not the one who said, it is finished, before he breathed his last breath. He is not the one who was in the tomb for three days and then rose again. And he is not the one who now is reigning as king, the right hand of God, and who is the first advocate before the Father. The Spirit is not this advocate. And Jesus is, and that's the foundation. That's the living water that comes, that then the living water is the Spirit because of Christ. But the Spirit is the necessary part too, the application. Again, He is the one who takes everything of Christ, what He did for us, and literally gives it to us. It is the action of the great exchange that was worked by the Spirit. Jesus took upon our sin so that he could give his righteousness to those who are unrighteous, the great exchange. And so that very giving is by the Spirit. He is the one who clothes us with the righteousness of Christ, adorns us with that white robe as he works faith within us, as he brings life within us and causes us to see Christ and Christ alone. He's the one who literally puts the garment over you so that when you stand before the Father, he says, I see my son justified. You're justified. I declare you right before me because you're covered in my son. So he literally clothes us. He's the one who presents us to the Father. Here you go. Here's my sheep. Here you go. I present you to them. And this is all as he works faith within us for us to come to Christ, to see him. This all comes out of us before the Father because we're presented before him. So he is that someone who gives evidence, presents evidence before the judge, before God the judge. He gives the evidence that stands up to his legal demands. And that stands up to the debt that we owe. That's the whole presentation, the Spirit presenting us. Say that they're justified. There's no condemnation in them because of Jesus. The debt is paid. He is the second advocate that shows proof of the first advocate. 
that Jesus was and is our first advocate. The Spirit shows proof of that, proof of life. This is in our salvation when we come to Christ for salvation at some point when we live, while we live. And this is the whole, all the while as sanctification then carries on from that point of salvation. This is what's happening. So it's not only our position in Christ when we come to be saved that we're presented, we're clothed by the Spirit, but it carries on that He is then working within us causing us to show evidence that that proof of life is real, that that first advocate was ours. He stood in our place, literally, for you. Adding to this is the detail that connects us to, to verse 15 that we've been talking about for some time now. How does the true believer actually keep the commandments of God? How do we actually obey? As you live your life, how do you actually do that? Is it in your own strength? It is by the spirit of truth. As we are, as, as, as we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, when we come to him by faith, then we live the rest of our lives in that reality. So how are we even able to do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. The moment we are born again, He never leaves us. He's always working within. So we are forever clothed in His white robe, and that reality shows itself. Now, as a true believer, is the only time when someone can ever do good deeds that are pleasing to God. Yet they are still not the moralistic kind that are what makes us right before God. It's not by our obedience that we keep in His good graces. We can never obey enough. Never. It's all about Christ. It's all about what he did and then the spirit applying that and actually making that a reality in an ongoing process, an ongoing reality. So he declares us right and by the spirit we show evidence that we are right. In that light are the only times that we could see works of righteousness. Apart from Christ, our righteousness is filthy rags to God. But by the Spirit, they're righteous because they're clothed with the righteousness of Christ and they're produced by the Spirit. As the Spirit works in and through us, this is how we keep His commandments. As we've said many times, this is an ongoing and growing process as we walk according to God's truth. This is the connection to the spirit of truth in this text. God works through the mind to reach the heart, to affect the life. So as we are sanctified by his truth, we change more in ourselves. And that comes out in the way we live and what we do and what we think and how we act. And this is being conformed to the image of Christ, the image of the righteous one who was our advocate. Covered in the clothes of Jesus, this is the Spirit presenting us, again, as our advocate. He presents us as our advocate to the Father. He is showing evidence that we are justified. It is an ongoing evidence that we are no longer under condemnation, but we walk in the truth, because the truth himself has set you free, and you will be free indeed. And the second advocate is said in this text that he is with us forever. Do we get what that says? That he is with us forever if we are truly in Christ. With us forever? Because I keep going? Because I keep being obedient? 
Can I fall from the state of grace? Can I not be justified? Can I lose my justification status before him because of what I do? If that's the case, then how can he be said to be with us forever? This is, of the, prom- this is the promise of the gospel. That those that God saves, God keeps. God keeps because God is at work in them. Not because they're so good, but because he is so good. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He is the one who actually makes those glorious words true in your life. The working out of that exact promise. That exact promise that he will never leave us, never forsake us, hangs on the sovereignty of God. It has to. Because if any of our salvation, whether it's coming to salvation or keeping it, is dependent upon what we do, then how in the world can these things be said? And these words too. And this is such a well-known verse. I don't know how we can't get that. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of the Lord Jesus. Do we seriously understand what that means? Our salvation, our keeping, has nothing. It cannot be dependent upon us. He who began a good work in you, rebirth, he will bring it to completion. He's the one who does it. He doesn't abide in us forever based on how good we're doing. If that were the case, then it wouldn't be forever. Because guess what? When you come to salvation, how does the Bible describe you? The Bible describes you as an infant. So in the very first five minutes, guess what's going to happen? You will fall quickly. Right out of the gate as an infant in Christ. So if one sin ruined all of humanity, how do we think that we can keep it going if it's based upon what we do, whether in whole or whether in just contributing to it? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Otherwise, we can't do it. His abiding is based on the promise of God to save and to keep those he saves. That's the promise of the gospel. A promise comes from one person. It's not contingent upon you. It's not a contract. It's a promise. He's the one who fulfills it. And faith holds on to these promises of God in the gospel. Faith looks at those those promises and says, I believe that you will keep me because of what your son has done. I trust in your promises because I know who I am. And faith is worked by the Spirit in the new heart. It's not something we produce. It's not a contribution. It's something that the Spirit actually produces in this He is faithful. It's all over Scripture. He's faithful. And this is how it plays out in real time. So how can we read this? Another helper will be with you forever. If we believe it's upon us, we have to take that word out of the Bible. And are you willing to cut up God's word? This is a spirit that Jesus says the world cannot receive. Now, what is the reason for this? They cannot. Notice that word. What is that word? It's a word of ability. They cannot. They have no ability to receive him because they neither see him or know him. So what does it mean to see him? 
is to spiritually understand him by gazing upon the meaning of his action and a purpose and doing so, doing that gazing in a right discernment, gazing upon the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, gazing upon the meaning of what he does and what his purpose is. And doing so in a right understanding. To know him is to know him through personal experience. Where he changes you. And who you are and in what you do. So if you do not show proof of life, then you're not alive. It makes absolutely no sense that we can can say a Christian can show no proof of life can even go into unbelief and still be saved. They were never saved in the first place if that's the reality of their life, the pattern, the ongoing reality, because guess what? The life giver shows that he gives life. He shows his work. He shows what a beautiful recreation you are. He shows it by painting a beautiful mural of your life. This paintbrush just flows out into your life, into the action of your life. You show his mastery of what he's done. You show it. And you know it by personal experience. You know that the Spirit of God, through his truth that you have been confronted with, he's changed you. And you know it's him. You know it's not just some mystical experience or some new age craziness or some whatever it is. You know it's the Spirit of God because you've been confronted with the truth of God and He's the Spirit of truth. He brings that upon your mind, heart, and soul and He changes you. And you know it's Him. You attribute it to Him. So in order to understand this, we cannot pass by the word cannot. The world, people in their state of sin, which may be you, have no ability to see the Holy Spirit and know Him, to gaze upon His action and His purpose and a right understanding. And I'm not talking about... a seminary degree with theological just perfectness. We'll describe what it actually means in a minute. But people in their state of sin have no ability to see the Spirit and know Him. 1 Corinthians 2.14 explains this more by saying, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We need the Spirit of God within us to give us an understanding of the Spirit of God and to accept what what he's done, the things of the Spirit of God, who he is and what he does, his purpose. This is so critical. And so there's a connection to be made here in this text. Truth, seeing, knowing is all connected. It's all connected. That's why the gospel must be preached, because it's a gospel of content, words, meaning, to explain the truth of salvation in Christ and in Christ alone, so that you see, you know, and seeing and knowing is loving Christ. So fundamental to this is understanding who we are as sinners. Understanding how bad we are. Taking this words of cannot, this words of ability and knowing that in our sinful heart, we don't want God. We're walking the other way. We're loving the darkness. Love. It's a condition of the heart. So we need to hear and to understand how bad we are so that we can hear and understand how good Christ is, 
how unrighteous we are and how righteous Christ is. And the Spirit does this. Without the Spirit, we cannot know then how to live. We cannot know how to live. So when the world can't see the Spirit of truth or know the Spirit of truth, then they'll show it. They'll show it. Lawlessness will be evidence. Falsehood will be evidence. By your deeds, by your actions, you will show you're not truly His because it's not rooted in Him. It doesn't come from Him. It doesn't acknowledge His Lordship, His grace. And you give in to falsehood. You give in to lies. Lies that you're a good person. Lies that you have good things that you can do before God. Lies that you can throw your coins of merit in that bucket. And as time comes, when you stand before him, it can weigh in your favor. You give in to these lies to follow your own heart. I saw a quote the other day. It said, every person is born with a clean heart. It's the very opposite of what the scriptures tell And what we know by our conscience, we're not born with a clean heart at all. It's black. So without the spirit of truth, we cannot know how to live. We don't live a life that glorifies God. We have no igniter within us that causes us to grasp the truth and no enabler within us to make that truth come to life. We may claim to be a believer, I did for 30 years. Claimed, yeah, I'm a Christian. But it doesn't line up with the reality of what the scriptures paint. Ahead of us in the chapter 16, verse 7 through 10, nevertheless, I tell you the truth that is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. This explains more what we're studying today. So concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Sinful world full of unbelief. In our sinful state, we do not believe in Christ. We're walking in unbelief. And that's a a lawlessness within us. Lawlessness doctrinally and a lawlessness behaviorally affects our life. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, that He was actually who He said He was. And He actually fulfilled all righteousness as our substitute. So righteousness has everything to do with the gospel, the gospel message and understanding the righteousness of Christ and the unrighteousness of ourselves. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Therefore, Jesus is the authority. Jesus is the rightful ruler. Jesus is the judge. This all describes... The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation. It's all the same. Because why? Because it addresses our sin, something that we need to hear about. Our sin according to God, what God says. It addresses righteousness. The righteous one, the advocate, and addresses the rightful ruler who has come to claim what is his. Not only in the world in a common sense, a general sense, but his people that he is king over. They bow down to, they're subjects to him. They live according to his law, his word, his rule. This explains the beauty of salvation in Christ. So with this spirit, we can know how to live. Because we do see him. We do see and marvel, gaze upon, and behold his action, his purpose. 
We understand that. That He came in and changed me. Because I heard about Christ and about who I was. Eternal life for a lifeless sinner. You can run to Him, trust in Him because of what He's done for me and not because of what I've done for Him. William Gurnall described faith as two hands. One to throw off your self-righteousness. One to cling to the righteousness of Christ. That's what faith is. And all that describes is trusting in the promises of God. So then we can now know how to live. We can know that we are only righteous because of Christ. That we know that we have victory in Christ over sin, over death. And we know that we live under his lordship. We know that he is king. And that I have to, because I want to, be governed by him in every aspect of life. Not just in these walls that we're so accustomed to. But out there, because it gets real out there, very real. And the reality brings it to bear upon our hearts, our minds, our souls, that He will be in us. He will forever be in us so that when we go out into the world, He is empowering us. He is in us, working His will, His pleasure, His purposes. This affects your life. And if it's not, what's going on? What's your state, really? We look back at the early history of the church, New Covenant. What made these Christians so different? What in the world would compel Paul after he's dragged out of the city? They thought he was dead. Dragged out of the city. He goes back into that same city a couple days later and preaches the gospel. What makes these men stand before the governors, rulers, say, no, we're going to obey God, not you? Psalm 2 is applied to you as they stood before them. What in the world compels people to do that? They actually went out into life and stood upon the truth of God in word and in deed. They actually went out and dealt with the world. Are we doing that today in our Christian culture? A lot of the world and even a lot of the church would, if you do that, and you do it really in light of showing how they looked, they're going to look at you and say, you're a bunch of angry, divisive, misguided Christians. And that's how a lot of people would look at those who were there on Saturday morning, standing, preaching the gospel loudly, boldly, calling out to men and women to stop. Don't go into that building. Singing hymns and praise. Praying. Being witnesses to not only the police officers who were there, but the death escorts who were there and everybody around. People would look at that and say, we shouldn't do that. You're too angry. Is that really anger? And the deeper question is, is what's happening in there, is that actually murder? And this is just one example, but it's so real in my mind now, even more. You see cars pull up on the sidewalk and 12 people rush around that car very quickly to get them into that building. 
you see fathers drive up woman as you stand there plead with them to be the father God called them to be When we first got there, there was a black Mustang that pulled up. This guy got out and kind of escorted his girlfriend into, and they took her in. I saw him drive away, and I was, I was like, I wonder where he's going. I wonder if he's close by, that he may be just waiting. So I walked around the block, and there was a McDonald's there, and guess what? He's sitting in the parking lot. This guy was hardly spoke any English, tats all over his neck, and walked up to him and started talking to him. The more and more I talked to him, the more he showed that he knew what was happening. And I said that to him, you know exactly what's going on. This was a man who said he was going to be a pastor earlier on in life. And I pleaded with him. I showed him video of the baby that was just, came into the world by God's providence that we were thankful to help. Pleading with him, don't leave. Guess where he was from? Tennessee. Drove two states to come to murder a child. I'm telling you, if you want to see the realities of this world and you want to be changed by the grace of God, go to places like that. No matter how nervous you are, because boy, was it really hard for me. To stand in front of some other man who is twice my size, who could have knocked me out with one punch, and I'm standing there pleading with him, please, just talk to me. Be a man. He said, boy, you have no idea who you're talking to. I thought to myself, I don't care. (laughs) What does that matter? I'm telling you, this is a wickedness in our life, and if we do not do something, there's so much we can do, but that is on the front, one of the front lines, and that will change you. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. And you will see the realities of this world. We need to see it. We need to. We need to. Because it's a sacrifice that they're offering up their child for a better life now. That is what is the reality. And the church is indifferent, silent, even giving in in various ways and saying it's okay. So the Spirit compels us to live out the life that God has called us to live, showing evidence of this reality that he has made us alive. Do we see this more and more in our homes? Growing in that striving to be who God has called us to be no matter how hard it is. In our self-restraint, the things that we give in to, our churches, to not just come here and just say, praise this to God, I'll give you an hour, you know, do my duty, and then I'm gone. Never having a part of the life of the church. Never deliberately going out into your life and conscious in your vocation that God's called you to. There's so much to address. The Spirit makes this alive and growing so. Again, this is not about perfection at all. If it was, you'd know I would be up here.
And I have four, four very close people who would attest to that. Spirit shows evidence. And that is a glorious work of the grace of God because of the promises of God. Cling on to those promises. Trust in them. Grow in them. Because he's a real God who changes lives for his glory, for his purpose. Not ours. That is a beautiful thing. Let's pray.